Anyway, <clears throat> we're gonna get uh, we're gonna finish off today with some election news uh, because I want I want to cover election news. This is a really interesting article. Let's see, how's that look? I asked more than 50 Saskatoon residents what matters to them in this election. Here's what I discovered. What actually matters to Saskatchewan residents in this month's provincial election? If the 50 regular voters we recently talked to are representative, it's healthcare, cost of living, and schools. I'll admit, talking with random strangers isn't easy. When I wake up, when I walk up to a stranger on the street, my gut clenches and I have to force a smile. But it's important and the insight it gives CBC is valuable. That's why I've spent the last couple of months asking Saskatchewan people what's most important to them. Both in an online forum that solicited more than 150 responses from across the province and in conversations on the street in towns and cities across southern Saskatchewan. I visited five communities going into different places from a powwow ground to a parental rights meeting. <clears throat> well, some people just shrugged and said they haven't been paying attention or didn't plan to vote in the October 28th election. There were three consistent themes that came up wherever I went. I got a glimpse into how people are navigating their day to day lives and how they hope the next government will help tackle the issues of healthcare, education and cost of living to make their lives better. A stretched healthcare system. Brenda Andrews, 64, wrote to CBC via our online form saying she hadn't been able to see an ophthalmologist for a complex glaucoma. She'd also struggled with walking and after a few months of not having the issue properly diagnosed or dealt with, she paid for an MRI scan in the US to get to the root of the issue, she said. We paid all our, working, all our working lives into the healthcare system. Now it is not there for us, said Andrews, noting her rural hospital in Kamsack has dealt with a loss of services and beds in the, in the past few years. In my opinion, Medicare is dead. We just haven't buried it yet. It's not a problem among just seniors either. I spoke to first time voter and college student Alistair Watson in Estevan, who said with complex health needs, healthcare was top of mind for him as well. <clears throat> My medical appointments are usually long trips halfway across the province that get fairly expensive for gas and food and hotels. And it's all that for a 20 minute appointment that could have been done over like a video call. He said, noting this means missing school and seeing his grades suffer. It wears on me. <clears throat> now, I'd just like to know that um, <clears throat> the conservatives plan for this is going to be, oh, therefore, we should privatize health care. That's always going to be the conservative move for this. That's because you need to understand that Canadian conservatives ultimately want Canada to be a clone of America. That's been their plan. That was Harper's plan. That's the plan of the Fords, absolutely. They want Canada as mini America. That's their perfect Canada. Okay? So just a bit of a note there. Shay Millard is currently on maternity leave uh, from her role as a registered nurse in a, Re a Regina hospital operating room. But she saw the stresses on the healthcare system from the other side. We're the level one trauma center in the city, and it's really hard to get coverage and appropriate staffing. You pick up more on-call shifts than is possible for one person, and it's just a lot of overtime and a lot of long shifts late nights. The province has recruited several Filipino healthcare workers to come to Saskatchewan. Staff she described as fantastic, but she believes retention will remain an issue unless conditions are safer, less stressed, and less toxic for healthcare staff. People are leaving because they're overworked and it's not conducive with a family life balance. So they're leaving places like the OR where we need their expertise because there's a lot to learn there. 
two Saskatoon ER nurses speak frankly about a healthcare system they say has never been so bad. At Wayburn's Culture Days, registered nurse Asha Shivarajan, hope I pronounced that correctly, has seen Canadian citizens skipping long wait lines and going back to India for tre- to get treatment for illnesses like cancer. For her, the top election issue is getting people's qualifications assessed more uh, quickly to alleviate the stress in the healthcare system. I got my RN license just recently in 2024, 10 years after I passed my RN exam from Ontario. But since they had so much trouble with recognizing my RN license from a different province in the same country, it took me 10 years. <clears throat> she hopes to see her friends with nursing backgrounds avoid having to jump through multiple hoops to get their skills assessed. Finding the money to live. This is the number one issue, exactly like the states. Up here, the economy is number one. And if you look at the rhetoric from every single political party, it is so fucking clear that none of our parties are taking this even remotely as seriously as they should. But... Uh, If you'd like to see more about that, we did a deep dive uh, into that. You can go check out uh, that episode of The Maple Files. We also have a uh, INN exclusive, The Maple Files, um, basically covering the cost of capitalism in Canada. It's a great breakdown. It's a bit of a black pill. Uh, It basically really does highlight how down bad we are. I ran into Kaylee Pierce from Pence while out at the Lumsden Duck Derby in August. When I asked her husband what the top issue was, Pierce was quick to jump in and list off her family's rising power and grocery bills. With trying to feed five kids, they're growing and we want them to be healthy and happy. But if it's going to be the difference between a car payment and feeding my kids, no family should have to go through that, she said. Uh, no, absolutely not. No family should have to go through that. We shouldn't. In 2024, we shouldn't be making decisions like, do I cut back on food or make a bill payment this month? Like, I'm sorry. That just, that that can't be where we're at in 2024. It is embarrassing. Yep. Saskatoon Mother 5 says cost of living is her top election issue. That's why you see the conservatives repeating the phrase cost of living so much repeating how much groceries have cost um they're using these talking points because they the point of the conservatives is always to take policies that that benefit the rich and powerful and repackage them as pro worker uh standing up for the little guy sort of policies and if you look at Pierre's entire platform, which is just like, which is just like six slogans still, um, that's essentially what it is. It's a bunch of policies that are going to greatly benefit the have yachts and have minimal effect on the have nots. Just to reverse his little, which admittedly is a good phrase, back on it. She and her husband both have decent paying jobs, but Pierce said she wasn't sure how others who weren't so fortunate could make ends meet. Uh, Yeah, same. Same. My wife and I both do have decent paying jobs, and it's still a struggle. We're still struggling to make ends meet. Everybody I know, every single couple I know, two income. So both, both people are working, and they're still struggling. A lot of people, especially the boomer types, want to go, oh, well, you know, you just need to manage your money better. And it's like, yeah, the amount of people who are just not able to get by, uh, it's not, I, I always put it this way. If the majority of people are apparently not managing their money well enough, then we need to rejig the system for just what you perceive as not managing money well enough because it's happening to the majority of people. Okay. These people are so narcissistic when they assume that like everybody else has some kind of problem that they've figured out. 
And as always, you pull back the veil and it's like some fucking business owner who it's like some business owner who got like a $50,000 loan from his like rich parents who also put him through call it through university and bought him a car. It's always those people who are like, you just got to manage your money better. It's ridiculous, she said. Right now, as parents, we're planning to hopefully be able to afford a big enough house so that our kids can live with us until they're 25 if they need to, and that sucks. That does suck. Especially since people are having to stay with their parents longer and longer because they can't afford rent. They can't afford, like, the basics. I know people who literally moved out, got like nothing crazy, like a bachelor or one bedroom. And then between rent, bills, groceries, all of it, they were working like a minimum wage job. They eventually were like, I I can't do it. I can't afford it. I can't afford rent, feeding myself and the bills I need. And they had to move back home. Tons of stories of these people. I noticed that Pierce wasn't alone in thinking of the future, particularly when it came to the cost of living and housing. If things are bad now, what what might they be like for future generations? Well, uh, given the trajectory of the West, future generations might be uh, saving up bottle caps because we live in a post-apocalyptic wasteland. But yeah, that's why I go back and forth with the kids thing, because honestly, guys, I will be completely, I will be completely real with y'all. I, um, I don't know if I want to, I'm not shitting on anybody who does have kids. God bless you. Raise them as part of the solution. Go for it. But I don't personally, I don't personally know if I can bring kids into this world. I don't. I don't know if it's even a morally right thing to do. Because who knows how bad the world's going to be in another 20 years. Deborah Cookson said she might she may have a home herself, but she has young grandchildren who are strig- struggling with what she called outrageous rents. By the time you pay that, you pay your food, you pay your gas, and you pay your bills, whatever else. They can't ever save any to put the down payment down, she said as she stopped along her walk at the legislative grounds in Regina. I don't want them to have to suffer the rest of their lives and not be able to get a nice house one day. Just being able to find a rental can be a challenge for many. Regina's Miranda Heinous said that when her old home flooded, she struggled to find a place that didn't have pests, was in a decent neighborhood, and would be affordable. At one point, I was actually looking into that option, sleeping in my car, if worse came to worse, she said. Anus was able to find a place that cost her 800 a month, but said others are not so lucky, and she can see how easy it would be to slide into homelessness. It being easy to slide into homelessness should not be a problem we're facing in the age that we live in. But it is. The sad reality is it's so easy and everybody feels that, right? You know, maybe your work lays some people off and you start getting anxiety because you know. You know that slippery slope of like if you lose a job or you have some kind of emergency, if you can't make rent, all of a sudden that snowballs and it can turn into you losing fucking everything. And just being out on the street. That's terrifying. And frankly, I don't think it's humane. I don't think that should be a world we ascribe to live in. I think we should do better. I think we have to do better. Education concerns. I was surprised by how many times people listed education as their major election issue including those who weren't teachers or parents of school-age kids. 
That was the case for a couple of university students I caught up with during the University of Virginia's move-in day. I'm passionate about students and teaching, but I worry about the younger generation, the new teachers that are coming into the profession, said Arlene Lowe, a school principal from Davidson who was helping her child move into the university for the first time. I feel like there's so much pressure on them and they don't have the supports that they need. Estevan Public Youth Center Executive Director Marissa Scarlett said she could see the impacts of COVID-19 and interruptions on learning every day in her job. Some kids she sees struggle to write uh, their own name, she said. Oh, well, would you look at that? Now it's fine to talk about that kind of stuff. The lasting effect that these policies had on kids. Which people were sounding the bells on from the beginning. From my job, I see 11 to 17 year olds who have a hard time reading and writing. And if you can't read or write, you're going to have a hard life. She said noting those missing skills could have a knock-on effect in other areas of a young person's life, from their mental health to finding a job. You see a rally outside here in Regina. The year-long contract dispute between teachers and the government appeared to leave a bitter, bitter taste in... Um, a bitter taste in voters' mouths, particularly for those who are educators or who identified themselves as relatives of educators. Now, the big question, is any one issue enough to sway change? While healthcare, education, and affordability repeatedly came up as crucial topics, most voters didn't seem to have a clear answer on which party was best placed to address these issues. And therein lies the problem. People aren't stupid, guys. Like, this is everyone I talk to. They're like, I don't even know who's gonna fix any of this. Doesn't seem like anybody's like taking this as seriously as we take it. And that just goes to show how out of touch these political parties have become in this country. First Nations voters I spoke to at a Treaty 4 celebration in Fort uh, Kepal expressed a real sense of disconnect with politicians who were seen by and large as not honoring treaties and doing little more than paying lip service to things like truth and reconciliation. The government has to take some responsibility for their actions and move forward, says Nadine Goodwill from Standing Buffalo, Dakota Nation. She said she hoped to see more action from politicians on sharing land and resources, especially with First Nations people as promised in those treaties. Governments need to sit down and talk with First Nations people to ad address key issues like climate change. <laughs> oh, that's cute. They think our government's going to do anything about climate change. Yeah, uh, not when our entire political apparatus is subservient to corporations, unfortunately. Sadly, our mindset is straight to more materialistic and greed rather than working together, living as one people and looking after Mother Earth, he said. Well, that sounds like communist, brother. <laughs> For all the time and energy politicians have spent arguing against the carbon tax, which again, mind-blowingly silly. Not one person I spoke to on the streets raised the carbon tax as a top election issue. No, no one gives a fuck because they know that leaving it in or taking it out, that's not gonna move the needle. That's how down bad Canadians are. That's why nobody's like, yes, get rid of the climate, uh, the carbon tax, or no, we gotta keep it. No, they're like, guys, like figure, figure this the fuck out. Only a few rated the climate as their top election issue, even after another hot and smoky summer and more temperature records being broken across Saskatchewan. <clears throat> to be fair, to be fair, I think the biggest problem here is that not a single person I've talked to has any actual faith 
in our politicians actually handling and addressing climate change. We don't have a great track record, first of all. Second of all, people kind of understand the main forces behind the environment getting wrecked. Our politicians are pretty chummy with those forces. So I think this is a problem of apathy. You know, you only talk about issues you feel like you you only talk about issues you feel like political parties can actually handle. And nobody I know has any faith in our governments in any of these parties to address something like climate change. They just don't have any faith. It is complete apathy. I don't know if you guys have seen different, but um that's just what I'm seeing. After 17 years of unbroken Saskatchewan party electoral success, the big question is whether any other party can make a dent in the support base. Um, it's more of a Saskatchewan issue. So, yeah, that's where we're at. Old man Barker. <clears throat> Stupid axe attack signs. Beside a sign declaring support for a new hospital somehow. Well, that's the problem. That's the problem. You got one party that essentially... <clears throat> you got one party that's essentially like, we don't even subscribe to this to the point where we're going to get rid of like anything that addresses it. You got another party that's like, this carbon tax will surely work, which I'll be the first to admit it doesn't. If you want to fix the environment, if you want to tackle climate change, if this is an important issue to you, the solution isn't to have the working class, the everyman shoulder the brunt. Nobody can afford any more economic stress. You add anything on top of it and people are going to fight against you. And this whole, like, we're in this together, bucko. We're doing it for the environment. We're saving the world. That's not going to work anymore. I'm sorry, it isn't. You need better solutions than, oh, we can save the planet by taking more of uh, gas station employees' uh, paychecks. Indirectly, but you kind of get it. Um, you need to hit... You need to hit the areas that matter the most. Fred Edward, the earth is basically a closed system. The total amount of carbon has been unchanged for millennia. The amount of CO2 in the air is not responsible for the weather extremes. What the fuck up? Interesting. Um, <laughs> I'm at a point in my life where I'm open to my mind being changed on pretty much everything. Um, one thing I definitely don't trust is I don't trust our leaders to solve the climate problem. Um, you know, that being said, it's it's possible they're deceiving us about that too. Just like they deceive us about everything else. Um, I, I have noticed it getting hotter year after year, at least where I live. Like I, 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 I'm, I'm experiencing it. I'm seeing the weather extremes. So whatever's going on, whatever's going on, we should be working towards a solution. And the big problem is uh, none of our leaders seem to have any ideas other than let, let's taxi every man more. You know, go after the military industrial complex, go after these big corporations that are literally using the planet as a fucking ashtray. That old lady down the street who works at Home Depot isn't the one that's putting holes in the ozone layer. That's all I really have to say about that. <clears throat> 